Today on CityCast Denver, wildfire smoke filled the skies above Denver this week, and hundreds of dead fish washed up on the shores of Sloan's Lake. So we're talking about climate change and all the other big stories of the week. Plus, a mini edition of our favorite one-star review game to celebrate Colorado's 148th birthday. Happy birthday, you beautiful rectangle. Today is Friday, August 2nd. I'm Paul Caroli, and here's what Denver's talking about. Welcome back to CityCast Denver, the show about the city with restaurant prices so high, it makes the Upper East Side look like the meatpacking district. <laughs> oh my gosh, Paul, this is so, your vacation last week. Yeah, guess guess where I was last week. <laughs> I also don't know those places that well. If those are like expensive I, places, I assume they are because it's New York. You and I but. both read enough New York Magazine, you think we would know by now. No, no, but we don't. But um, I, but, do, but share your grievance a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, I've been talking about this all week because we went, my wife and I went to New York City for a weekend. Great weekend. Uh, probably the best time I've ever had there. And uh, ate well, drank well. Some uh, of the best food in the world, I would argue. So cool. We went to like the, the buzziest pizza place, which I thought was mid, but I enjoyed being part of the hype. Um, Scars Pizza, to be specific. Sorry, Scars. <laughs> Sorry, you're mid, Scars. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my review from Denver, pizza <laughs> capital of the world. Um, but yeah, the prices there were Denver prices. And the quality was New York quality. So Denver is too expensive was what you're saying. Exactly. I what the agree. heck is happening? I, I I I was saying this earlier to you and Olivia. I think we're just too big for our britches at this point. We think we can charge things that we really should not be charging for forgetting that we are in Denver, Colorado, not yeah. New York City. I, I don't know how it's happened because you hear restaurant owners talking about like struggling after the pandemic sure. and you see some restaurants closing. But at the same time, like the cost of living has never been higher and people are struggling. And there's some obviously the prices are high because people must be paying them. It's somewhere. Some people. I don't know. I Maybe guess. this is part of why we're seeing restaurants close, too. It's not just that the costs are high for restaurants or the service fee stuff or the higher minimum wages or the food costs and all these things. Yeah. That It could be that as well as people just aren't frequenting because they don't want to drop 50 bucks every time you go to have lunch. Boy. You know? Yeah. So. That's the truth. Um, anyway, it's Friday here in the 5280 Magazine Studios. Uh, lovely day here. Uh, Bree is here, our host, Bree Davies. Hey, Bree. Hi, good morning. And uh, we have a great returning guest today, one of my favorite people to talk about climate change, which is a big topic for us we're going to get into in a minute. Um, she's the Associate Director of the Soil Carbon Solutions Center at Colorado State University and an authority on the intersection of climate justice, economics, conservation. Welcome back to the show, Lauren Gifford. Thanks, Paul. That's a weighty intro. I feel like I hope I can live up to it. I meant every word of it. I really do enjoy hearing what you think about this kind of stuff. You sound like the exact person we should be talking to right now about the topics we're about to talk about. It's on a perfect. Week, on a week like today. Yes. Um, but before we get, oh, actually, you know, Lauren, let me ask you about restaurant prices. Has that been your experience, what we were talking about? Yes. And actually a restaurant in Niwot, which is up near where I live in Louisville, mm -hmm. just had to like change their whole concept. I think they're called really? Faro. It was in the Daily Camera. Um, where people weren't doing fine dining. They couldn't afford fine dining. So now they're trying to like be mm. open longer hours and have, you know, more accessible options. Um, options yeah. Right. But I also just feel like trying to feed my family at a restaurant, it's it's ridiculous. Also, you have kids, you mm -hmm. know, like you're like, do I order this thing that they're not going to eat and pay $10 for it? Or do I just right. gamble <laughs> and hope that they will eat half of what I've mm -hmm. got? And... Mm. Yeah. Kid, even kids even kids menu prices sometimes. I'm like, ten dollars? It's a bowl of noodles with butter on it. This is rude. Can I try something out right now? I just thought of this. <laughs> uh, maybe this is like totally cliche, but fine dining, it's a bear. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um moving on. Um some business uh here. We're we uh we're working on a show about tourism because Denver saw a record number of tourists last year. So um we want to help because a lot of our like well-loved tourist places are very crowded. And um there's a lot of places that are underrated that we want to help, you know, point people in the direction of because yeah, like they're where also would great. you take somebody who comes to visit Denver? that maybe isn't on these lists mm -hmm. every year. You yeah. know, the Red Rocks of, you know, Denver. Paco Sanchez Playground. <gasps> yes. I call it American Ninja Warrior Playground. I know. I can't believe it is not 
like in a place where you have to pay to get in. It's like, incredible. This is a public playground, and it is so incredible. It's a very cool one. You know what has a similar design of playground? That one is also new. It's like this whole new. You probably, you two probably know more about this than I do, but it's a whole new like design philosophy with playgrounds. Is Congress Park has a new one like that too? Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. I didn't know that. I'll have to check it out. Always looking yeah. for a good park. Um, anyway, we want to hear from you, listeners. Where do you think are the the underrated, off the beaten path tourist destinations that are really, really worth taking out of towners to here in Denver and around Denver? Um, call in, leave us a message, send us a text seven two zero five zero zero five four one eight. Um, we would love to hear from you. Let's get to our top story. Um, climate change. This was a big one this week. Um, we were feeling it in all sorts of ways. Wildfire smoke filling our skies. Hundreds of dead fish washing up on the banks of Sloan's Lake. Uh, there are currently three fires blazing across the Front Range right now. I just heard the fourth one by um, Gross Reservoir. Is is that mm-hmm. the one? It's contained. By Boulder has been contained mm-hmm. oh, after good. destroying one house. Yeah, that was it just popped up yesterday. It's been contained. Very dry conditions. It seems like more could happen anytime. But Lauren, this is why we wanted to talk to you. Mm-hmm. What, what what has been your experience of this week? Well, um, for for background, I live in Louisville. So two years ago, we lost a thousand homes and businesses to the Marshall Fire, right? One of the most catastrophic urban wild interface wildfires that we've ever had, and uh, it, the fear is palpable when these fires start up again, and it's a little bit like, oh no. You know, we had one mm. um, at NCAR right just like right in the foothills of Boulder or two weeks ago. Luckily, didn't spread too much. But there's constant air traffic because the slurry bombers are flying overhead from the local airports to drop that red chemical fire retardant. Mm. Oh. And you can tell which planes are the slurry bombers. The bottoms of them are red. Apparently, they inadvertently dropped slurry, the fire retardant, into Boulder Reservoir. So not only was Boulder Reservoir, you know, too warm to begin with, and now it has this toxic chemical in it. Oh, my Um, gosh. And and the fires are just – you can't even see the mountains. Like I was one mile from the mountains this morning, and I couldn't see them. Yeah, you were saying you were in Boulder Mm -hmm. dropping off your your kid at a theater camp. Yes, theater camp. Um, (laughs) And, uh, yeah, it's just – it's disturbing. It is apocalyptic. And I was talking to a friend yesterday who also works in climate change, and he said, how can we work? I just can't work today. Yeah. And I mean, I think about my neighbors. I've got – my neighbors next door are roofers. Like, those guys are outside all day. Mm-hmm. And they're – you know, like, it is really scary. Right. Physical labor. Anyone who's working yeah. landscaping, construction, roofing, it's, it's just really dangerous. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's um let's talk about like the response a little bit. Governor Polis called out the Colorado National Guard to help fight the fires on Tuesday, and KDVR reported Thursday that 600 Colorado firefighters who had been actually sent to the Pacific Northwest have now been called back. Um, Axios Denver, in response to that news about the, the firefighters getting called back, quoted Colorado's executive director for public safety, Stan Hilke, saying that he, quotes, gets a little bit worried about our long haul. Um, he, he feels he'd feel a lot more comfortable if we had some good resources back in the state. And it sounded like he was feeling like maybe that we're not as prepared as we could be for the public safety implications. Lauren, does yeah, that absolutely. resonate with you? Yes. I mean, there is um, – well, first of all, we don't have enough firefighters and we don't pay them well enough. I was just going to mm. say, I have a couple of friends who are no longer firefighters and they love the job, but they can't afford to right. do it. And we need these people – all the time now, right? Yeah. And and there's also like firefighter fatigue, first responder, you know, PTSD. This is really, really hard work. And we don't treat the people with the respect that they deserve, right? It's one thing to tweet out like, thank you to the firefighters, you know, but but pay them, right? right. <laughs> Give them year-round jobs, not just during high fire season, um, you know, give them the services that they need to be refreshed and and come to their job with their best selves. Hmm. Well, that's actually really interesting because that touches on something that I heard from someone a few weeks ago that I've kind of like not been able to get out of my head about firefighters, which is that, um, and I, this is very unpopular, which is why no one talks about it, but apparently the budget for firefighters in Denver is like really bloated. Like we have more year round firefighters than we need because there are fewer fires in the cities than we used to have. Mm. And like you, you, if you see around town on any emergency call, there will always be a fire truck, even if there's no fires, because they they have more staff than they need just they on a chronic basis. Too, yeah. 
Whereas in these high like wildfire seasons, it sounds like we we have not enough. So it seems like there's a real mismatch based on this changing environment. Yeah, there should be like some way to delegate or spread out the services or help that we have. Like some folks are more on call, but can go to different parts of the state. Or, I mean, I'm sure this is something they're thinking about and talking about, but it does make you think about how municipal budgets can kind of keep us isolated in certain ways from actually servicing the people in places that need it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I need to look into that more. I'm not totally locked in on that, but I, that, that's a, an interesting topic. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that more in the future. Brie, I wanted to talk to you about the Denver part of this because, you know, Lauren's talking about the foothills and Boulder, but here in Denver, I got to be honest, I, I'm not hearing people freaking out. No, I mean, I'm more, it's more about, I think direct effect on us is air quality. I would just say from these, cause I'm thinking about, um, last week when we had like the 10th worst air quality in the world in Denver. And I've le- I learned- Oh, is that true? Yeah. And I learned from our um, previous guest, Chris Bianchi, uh, the meteorologist, that it's our the topography. We're like in a bowl. So it collects. So I think that's the thing that people in Denver are probably feeling the most next to if you have f- friends or family who are affected because they live maybe in the outlying areas where these are these uh, fires are happening. But I would agree. It's not necessarily top of mind for Denverites just because we're not experiencing it in the same way that someone who's like in Lyons is experiencing it. Hmm. I wonder about, um, I wonder about the, like the evacuation question, Mm -hmm. Lauren, because I was seeing some articles about people like weighing whether or not to leave their homes. I had a text exchange with a friend about this last night. She says, do I pre-evacuate pack or not. She lives up Boulder Canyon off Magnolia Road. They were they were in pre-evacuation. She's got two kids. She's like, I guess I pack things. And, you know, where do I go? Do I go to my parents in Denver? Do I go to a friend's mm. house? Do I go to a hotel? Yeah, I don't I wouldn't know how to make that decision. I mean, I know that the advice is to like have a go bag full mm-hmm. of like essentials that you you can be ready with at we any all, time. We all need to be preppers, apparently. Like, <laughs> it's kind of depressing. That's right? what I keep hearing from preppers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I also just think it's like your station in life. Can you evacuate? Um, right. I think a lot of folks don't. I'm thinking about folks with disabilities where it's a little bit more complicated to evacuate, especially if your home is equipped with things that help you exist in the world and like just Mm. going to a hotel is not an option or maybe um you are near your job and you don't have a car and you have to you're going to stick it out hoping you know what i mean these these things that like make our lives more precarious or not and the amount of options you have i think really dictates if people decide to evacuate and when because it's not like people are holding out and like don't care and and you know like or like it'll pass it's more probably a e- bigger existential question of like can i survive absolutely if i need to leave my home you know and we see this like in in other times when people have to leave and and they you know who can't leave during hurricane katrina in I, gaza yeah. right it's the people who can't leave are the sick people the old people yeah yeah people with disabilities mm-hmm. young people i mean it really is yeah it's just more about what you have in the world mm-hmm. that allows you to make those decisions easier. Well, I, w- I think you two are maybe the best people to talk about this. Put that question over top of our specific geography. Mm-hmm. You know, here in Denver, you know, a lot of rich people live in the city. That's a trend over the last 20 years or so. But like, how do you see our geography fitting with that question about, you know, the socioeconomics of like survival? Yeah, that's really, really interesting, right? Because actually one thing that we're seeing since we're talking about climate change now is that wealthy people can live in high risk areas because they can afford the insurance mm. or they can afford to rebound. So if you look at places where there was fire, wildfire 10 years ago, even in Louisville two years ago, you see the people who've been able to build back have been the people with means. And actually a lot of insurance companies aren't going to insure people in high risk areas, right? In the foothills. So whether you can pay a really high premium, you can build a house that has a lovely concrete bottom mm-hmm. and stones around it, uh, you can live there. But if you were a person who lived in a mobile home or, or you're you know, a renter. A renter, right. So the renters after the Marshall Fire have been almost completely displaced and they did not receive the insurance benefits of yeah. a homeowner. Hmm. 
Wow. Just so, so challenging in so many ways. This, I mean, it's, it's a slow moving crisis, climate change, but it, these, some of these effects happen really fast and they snuck up on us, I think. Well, and as a person who's been thinking about climate change for 20 years, I wonder, is it slow moving anymore? Right? Hmm. Like I have lived in Colorado now since 2011. We have had multiple catastrophic floods. We have had dozens, if not hundreds of wildfires, like People can't even be outside in the summer. It's too hot, physically too hot. The air quality is bad. The fi- We're having massive fish die-offs. Like, is it slow moving at this point? Or is it or we're literally it. here? We're here. We're li- yeah, we're literally right. in it. it. We, it there's a cognitive dissonance, though, of like, can we see this or not? Can we, can we realize? And luckily, I, I always say I live in Colorado for a reason because we have elected officials, by and large, not all of them, but elected officials who support climate action. And that's huge, right? This is a place where the community is aware and wants to do something. That's a good point, too, about the politics, because we often talk about that, the politics being a reason that attracts people to Colorado for things like legal legal weed early on, but also abortion access, but maybe even it's climate issues. Mm-hmm. Like, are the people that we elect going to be on my same page about what we need to do about this issue, or are they totally on another planet I can see that being a determining factor why someone might want to live here if they have the the means or the choice to. It feels like a very Western, Western value to me that like being able to bind together as a community to take on a collective threat, but also respect people's like individual rights to make their own way in the world. That's that's where I'm seeing the intersection there. But anyway, Lauren, you brought up the the fish. Um, so to to be clear about what happened at Sloan's Lake, maybe some Northsiders were smelling uh, rotten fish all week. Um, it's because... 400, uh, at least 400 fish died last weekend during um, the uh, heat wave that we had. According to the Denver Post, this is this is all climate related. But Bree, do you understand like why why this happened? Yeah, so I guess the heat is the big thing about it. Is like the Sloan's Lake in particular is one of those man made lakes that is not that deep, and so mm. if it doesn't go deep, the water doesn't stay cool as long as it would in a deeper lake. And then the heat also leads to a overgrowth of the blue algae. Where green is blue green algae, blue green algae, and that in in large amounts can be toxic. So it's toxic to animals and people. So fish obviously are in those lakes; they're getting boiled, and uh, this algae is producing toxins that's killing them too. Nightmare scenario. It's so gross. I can't imagine like walking by Sloan's Lake or like going on my morning run on Monday around the lake and just being seeing like, oh, what? Well, Paul, you're near a small lake too. I mean, you live by Lollipop Lake. It's not that. It's the same thing. It's probably like five feet deep, maybe. I've seen them dredge it before. It's not very deep. I haven't thought about that. I haven't been over there this week. I should. I should go see if there's any. um, I'm like, could they just dig them deeper? (laughs) I wonder. I wonder. I know they're they like put water in the lake. That's part of how they're responding. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, so they're putting. I mean, I'm not a a water person. I feel like as an academic, I have to be like (laughs) out of my wheelhouse, but I can chat on it. Um, You know, they are adding water. One of the things that I thought was interesting when I was reading about this is that these were fish that were not stocked. A lot of these lakes stock fish for people to to fish for you know fun or for food, but these were naturally, these are fish that were naturally born in that lake. And that just, to me, seems like this is really cutting at the heart of the ecosystem there. Of course, like if it's a man-made lake, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's complex, right? Yeah. But I hope this is a wake up call to folks that like, this is real. This, this extreme heat is here and it's going to get worse and these are the ways that it's going to show up in our lives. Well, our producer Olivia was doing just some really cursory research earlier this week and was like, oh, weird. We had the same headline basically four years ago, the exact same problem happening. So like you're saying, it's like this is not new mm-hmm. and it's going to keep happening. So what do we do now? Mm-hmm. How do we how do we handle it? Well, that's the question. We'll we'll leave it there. Um, listeners, if you have answers, we would love to hear them. I'm sure other people would too. Uh, the text us, leave us a voicemail with your answers to the question of climate change. <laughs> the Stinky Lake Hotline at 720-500-5418. Um, yeah, so we're going to go for a quick break and come back with some Colorado birthday celebration. This episode is brought to you by Fox Restaurant Concepts. 
Culinary Dropout at Nine & Co. serves classic meals done right. And with a spacious outdoor patio complete with fire pits and a gaming area, this spot is for anyone who enjoys killer food and delicious drinks in a beautiful space. Oh, and did I mention they have live music on the weekends too? Check out Culinary Dropout's happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. and newly announced a special deal all Wednesdays and Thursdays called the Dropout Duo, which includes a charcuterie board and any two craft cocktails for only 30 bucks. Culinary Dropout opens weekdays at 11 a.m. and Saturdays and Sundays at 10 a.m. for weekend brunch. You can make reservations, inquire about private events and group dining, view the menu and order online at culinarydropout.com. That's culinarydropout.com. Hey, it's Paul Caroli, executive producer with CityCast Denver. And I know it's not always easy finding your way here in Denver. When I first moved here, I didn't understand what people were talking about when they said we needed the moisture so bad. It's a very dry climate. I understand that now. And that's why the mission of CityCast Denver speaks to me. We spend all day, every day, finding the most compelling stories, the most interesting people, and the best insider recommendations so you can make the most of this city and also make this city better. Members of CityCast Denver make that possible, and we couldn't keep doing this work without you. Become a member of CityCast Denver today at membership.citycast.fm and get exclusive perks like ad-free listening, event invites, and members-only updates. That's membership.citycast.fm. Thanks. All right, we're back. As I mentioned, we are celebrating Colorado's birthday this week. It was on Thursday, the 148th year of our state's existence. This always reminds me how young we are. We're not yeah. that old of a place. No, it really is. It I mean, is like a few generations. Less than 150 years. Yeah. yeah. And I was trying not to feel offended when you were talking about New York because I'm originally from Philadelphia. Oh, really? <laughs> and that's like a place where things are old here in the U.S. I mean, really? not compared to Europe, right? But old. And then I live in Louisville and my house is 70 years old and people are like, oh, you have one of those old houses. <laughs> it's like, it's my parents are older than my oh, house. Really? Like, it's not that old. But in oh. Colorado right. years, in Colorado. it's not that much. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to talk about some old stuff here in this segment because we're going to do another edition, a mini edition of our, our famous one-star review game. Oh, boy. So if you don't remember how this works, I've pulled a few one-star reviews for distinctly Colorado destinations. And I have to go against Brie Davies for oh this? Oh, my gosh. Don't worry. Sometimes I really suck at these games. Okay. All right. I just feel like... <laughs> it's the... hit or miss. And also, I didn't know this was happening. So. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm not, just... like, prepared. Okay. Anything. I know. But you're just... You're a very Denver person, <laughs> right? It's like... Yes. Brie knows Denver. But this... Remember, this is about knowing haters. This is okay. about the people who will write a one-star review okay. for a great yeah. Colorado destination. It's so, a more even playing field. Okay. So okay. Channel, okay. channel your inner discontent. And as here's how it's going to go. Okay. As mm-hmm. soon as you know the place or you have a guest, just say your name and I'll stop reading the one-star review and then you can give me your answer. And great. our producer, Olivia, is going to keep score and then we're going to see who wins by the end of the segment. Okay, let's get into it. Um, our first one-star review is for a place that has a 4.8 star average on Yelp with 763 reviews. That means the one star is not common. Not common at all. Because it did not change that average this is a, This is a beloved place, but Peter R. had a bad experience. <laughs> Peter R. writes, if you feel like getting ripped off by the government, this is the place for you. After traveling across the country to visit this place and purchasing a timed entry parking permit three months in Lauren, advance. Rocky Mountain National Park. Oh, That's exactly it. right. That was on the tip of my tongue. That's See? exactly right. <laughs> Look at you. Lauren gets the point. Great, great job. Okay, next one. First of all, sorry, someone gave Rocky Mountain National Park a one star. Have they actually been there? I know, it's bizarre. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's probably this time a personal grievance. Fee. It's oh, all about the okay. reservation fees. The other oh. one star reviews were like, it was people, they're all pissed about the reservation system. And um, some it has people, a purpose. I know, I know. Sorry. Hey, they don't know. They would complain they, that it was crowded if I there know. was not the timed reservation. Yeah, this go is ahead, true. Paul. Um, they, the last line here is funny. The Peter R says, I guess the government is running low on cash and thinks it's okay to steal citizens' hard earned money pathetic oh my gosh pathetic Pathetic. we just have a guy that hates the government okay (laughs) yeah got it bugling elks pathetic i know beautiful views hate it worth it (laughs) hate it all right okay um our next one star review is for a place that has a five star average a perfect five star average on 864 reviews on tripadvisor okay um the one star review comes from jack w titled ouch Jack writes, 
this is a place just for waiting for an accident to happen. Mm. Too many people attempt this climb that have never hiked such a steep incline. It oh, is Lauren, not a hike. Oh, sorry, you were Lauren, first. Lauren, yeah. I think I heard the incline, you first. incline, but yeah. I think that's a tie. No, it's okay. <laughs> you were... <laughs> I'm the guest. Give it to us, Lauren. That's the incline in in the spring. Do you have, I need the full name, unfortunately. The Manitou incline. (laughs) I'm going to have to give Bree the point here. I got to give Bree the point. You had it though. But you, yeah. Okay. So just the the other, the other good line here. Jack says, uh, rather it is just a climb up many stair treads. Dangerous, foolish, just typical of the mindset that prevails in the springs. (laughs) Did he not like (laughs) Google it or like look at what it is? It literally is the Manitou incline. It's like, do you want to walk a bunch of stairs? Yeah. Come here. That's what it is. Right. Yeah. Anyway. I almost died climbing it up and then there's all these like Air Force guys with weighted backpacks running past I know. me in full I was gear. Like, I have like a fitness freak cousin and I say that in a great way. She's like just incredibly fit and she does it for fun kind of person. I'm so <sighs> jealous. Good, good <laughs> I was <for> jealous. <laughs> uh, I did it once. I felt so proud of myself. Did you want to die after though? No, I loved it. I had yeah. endorphins flowing. There's oh, a great yeah. view. Paul's a runner. You mm. know how runners are. They have... It's a different mindset. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So it's one to one. We're going into our next one star review. This place has 4.8 stars on average from 9,488 reviews on Google reviews. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. However, Mr. Ford man had a bad time. He writes, this used to be a nice slash fun place to visit, but now it is infested with liberal minded influences that are spewed from the mouths of every guide in the park. There were multiple mentions of, quote, climate change, unquote, (laughs) and claim it is the reason large areas of the park are closed to the public. Yet these areas were traditionally open in the past. There were also numerous mentions of many past sins of the evil white devils who should never have entered the area or opened the park in the first place. They also fail to mention and ignore evidence of cannibalism in the area that has surfaced over the years. What? I mean, I feel like this could be a critique of someone who goes to a lot of places in Colorado because yeah. like colonialism is at the root of how we're here. Mm-hmm. There's but, one more good clue coming. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Mr. Ford Man says, uh, blah, blah, blah. They fail to mention blah, blah, blah. And instead come up with strange, ambiguous ideas why the original inhabitants left the area. Leave it to the liberals to find a way to ruin everything and anything good in this country. I'm trying to think of another big park area mm, we haven't. Interesting, interesting. Chautauqua? No. I know. It's like uh, Garden of the Gods. All right. I'm going to take those last two guesses, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give out a point here. I thought okay. that original inhabitants leaving the area was going to be a good clue. Oh, Cliff Dwarves? Mesa Verde. Uh, Mesa Verde oh. National Park. Oh, we're park. going that far away from Denver. Colorado okay. Colorado destinations. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I was just thinking this was as. <laughs> Front metro range. area. Yeah, metro area. Okay. That's all right. You two are it's still tied at one. Okay. We're, right. gonna, we're gonna do, I think, one more and then we'll go to uh to the final round. Um hmm. I'm gonna move down to this last one. So this one is really good. Um this place got, gets 4.6 stars from 1,430 reviews on Yelp. Um, however, Teague or Tig R. Had a bad time. They write, this is the worst place to sh- see a show in the Western United States. Oh, Lauren. Re- Re- <laughs> Red Rocks. It's Red Rocks. <laughs> Lauren, you get the point. Sorry. Did Brian. I write that review? Maybe I did. <laughs> Do you, are, are you an- Oh, a super hater. Have oh. you ever written a one-star review? Uh, I don't. Maybe? I'm sure we've talked about it. I was just thinking, I just don't like Red Rocks. No. <laughs> Can I tell a quick Red Rocks please. story? And, oh, you know, yes, edit please. If you need. Um, I've been a Tribe Called Quest fan since I was 12. And they were playing their second to last show ever uh-huh. um, because Fife had passed away yeah. and they were doing this tour. But I was eight months pregnant. Oh, my God. And um, I bought one ticket and I put on a maternity belt. And at first I called a friend of mine who works in the hip hop industry and I was like, hey, do you know anyone on tour with Tribe? Could I go backstage? I need to pee every 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, my, yeah. yeah. And he was like, I don't. But also – I don't think if if I did, they would really want like a 37-year-old pregnant woman to like get the backstage (laughs) pass just so she could pee a lot. But so I walked all those steps in Red Rocks and like watched probably the best show of my life. And my daughter was there. I had like I you know a picture That's of a good eight months show pregnant. Story for walked your kid. home, waited until all the people left because I didn't want to possibly encounter drunk drivers. And so I sat in the parking lot until all the cars were gone and then I left. Um 
and then that was actually the last show that Tribe Called Quest ever played because they were like, we can't do a last show. This was it. That we taught. We how do you top this? Yeah, you wow. can't top Red Rocks. Twenty seventeen. Good for you. That is that's oh interesting. God. Good story. You know how dorky story. I looked in very maternity clothes <laughs> alone. <laughs> Where he's like, "What is this uh, unattended pregnant lady doing here?" <laughs> slowly walking to, <laughs> up and down the steps. Although to be fair, sometimes people will give you, you know, be like, "Oh my God, get out of the way, pregnant lady!" Needs yeah, to go to the bathroom. Yeah, not really happening. Yeah, that's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that just happened to me at Trader right, Joe's once. Right. This guy was like, "Pregnant lady," I was like, "I'm just shopping for it's groceries." The Wild West at Red Rocks. <laughs> you, if you get a spot, you keep. Keep it, I guess. Anyway, okay, so I think it's two to one. Yeah. Uh, who did I give the point to there? Lauren? So, Lauren, you're up with two. Okay. And yeah. Bri, you have one. Yeah. Now, unfor- now th- none of that, it's all out the window because this final round, it's worth exactly as many points as the person in second place would need to win it all. <laughs> um, so, in this case, that's Bree. So, it's worth two points. <laughs> and this final round is the clap back. Okay. Where you have to guess the place based on the owner's response, response to a review. Awesome. Okay. Now, in this I case, it's not a one-star these. review, but I thought this was just too good to pass up because I found this a few months ago and I just, I thought it was hilarious. Um, so this destination has 3.5 stars on average with 264 reviews on Yelp. Um, the only other clue I will give you is that it is closed. Okay. Permanently? Um, I would say yes. Okay. I would say yes, permanently. Okay. So the owner writes, the owner, Lauren B. writes, Let us know if you plan another trip through our town. We would love to greet and serve you. Patron are welcomed and encouraged to carry. Oh, Bree. Oh. Bree? Rifle Shooters Grill in Rifle, Colorado. That's correct. Shooters Grill. Lauren Lauren B. And Carrie, yes. I did not know the name of her place, though, so you would have won anyway. Paul made me go there. You went there? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not. This is the the Paul part of the story. It's not even there anymore, but Paul just wanted to experience (laughs) being in the restaurant. So you guys drove to Rifle? Because there's a new- To eat bad Mexican food. Nice, great service, terrible food at- Something that is in yes. a restaurant that used to be Shooter's Grill. Pawn shop next door. <sighs> Dicks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a pawn shop where, yeah, yeah, guns. Lots of guns. Although, I just want to say, last night I had a dream that I was vaping in a movie theater. <laughs> oh, my. <gasps> Two things. I don't go to movies, so that's wild. That's Second thing, rough. I don't vape, but I think I clearly was still having PTSD her. from the yeah. Bobert project we did. Yeah, there's a podcast about our trip to Rifle. We'll put uh, a link to it in the show I don't notes. feel like it's fair that I won, though, just because you decided the <laughs> Hey. No, it's okay, Brie. It's okay. I'll just come back. I feel for, so bad well, now. Invite me back, and we'll do it again. We'll do a you rematch. did really and good, I will, I'll be studying Yelp from now until then. <laughs> anyway, so Brie is our winner, but really, we're all winners because we get to live in this beautiful state, 148 years old, and 148 <laughs> more, hopefully. As so. our, our newsletter editor, Peyton Garcia, said in the newsletter today, you don't look a day over 148. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I love this joke. Um, all right, we're gonna take we're gonna take one more break, and we'll be back with uh, the best way to end the week: Rocky Mountain highs and lows. This episode is brought to you by Pine Melon, the farmers market delivered. Miss the farmers market this weekend? Don't fret, Pine Melon has got you covered, delivering Colorado's freshest local produce straight to your doorstep. Pine Melon is a next generation grocery delivery app that partners with over 200 local farmers, ranchers, and producers in Colorado. With a mission to transform Denver's food system, empower local makers, and promote community well being, they make supporting local both easy and rewarding. Enjoy high quality meats, eggs, and dairy from small local farms, as well as a wide variety of pantry staples, all delivered straight to you. The best part? Pine Melon offers same day delivery to Denver and Boulder within a two hour window, no subscription necessary. Support local today and use promo code CityCastDenver for $75 off your first delivery at pinemelon.com. Enjoy the best of the farmer's market, even when you can't make it there yourself. All right, and we're back. Best way to end the week. Sometimes we call them wins and fails. Sometimes we call them Rocky Mountain highs and lows. It's good stuff that happened and it's bad stuff that happened here in Denver. Um, So each of us brought a recent local something and uh, we're going to talk about them. Uh, Bree, do you want to start with a fail? Yeah, sure. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, Cultura Chocolate on on Morrison Road in Westwood was broken into. Oh. 
And what was really heartbreaking about it was, so Damaris that runs Cultura is like also one of the main people behind all the cool events that you go to in Westwood. Head show in Westwood. Okay. She, I mean, she's like one of the driving forces for the Frida Kahlo Fest and Pasole Fest and Tamale. Like she does it all. And what she, what was really sad was in the, the post that she shared on Instagram, she was like, this is someone that knew us intimately. They knew where our money was. They knew that we had just had a community event. So we had a lot of cash on hand. They just knew, they knew how to hide from the cameras. Like these were people that knew us really well. And it just, it made me extra mad because someone like her is putting so much work into the community every single day to make it more awesome. And I mean, she's single-handedly one of the forces behind Westwood just rising and being this beautiful place and that they targeted her and her business. It just made me so mad for her. And she just felt, and as rightfully you do when this happens, she felt so violated. Like they stole money, they stole her computer, they stole her scooter, but they knew when they weren't going to be in the building. They knew, cause like the thing is with the community events, a lot of times um, she's like, out in the community and het and uh cultura chocolate is open and there's they're a business but like it just it's a, a gathering place it's a really wonderful place for so many people and for someone to do that just crappy just crappy crime super crappy. it's one thing to just steal from people but to steal from a community member who's who p- goes out of their way to make things amazing for everybody just shitty to 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 prey on the vulnerability created by someone being so selfless yeah. to like make something yeah that sucks like knowing when she wasn't going to be there and like yeah just so my heart goes out to Cultura and um I think they their online business is still running they're closed for a couple of weeks but please support them otherwise buy their they they have great products they have great coffees they have great atoles like it's a wonderful place so I do love all their stuff oh, I mean the so chocolate good. is Chocolate's insane. It's, it's worth going over to Westwood for. So. For my side of town. Oh, um, do you know that place, Laura? No, but I will Google it and go buy something online immediately after we talk. And Gets they the have a uh, stamp of approval for sure. In August, they have this Saigon Azteca um, night market, which is happening on Morrison Road. And they're integral to that too. And you can kind of check out all the businesses around there. But it's it's also a super fun place for kids. And they I do just, really great kids events. I love any sort of third space, like a it's, library or yes. a street fair or a farmer's market. Like You'll love it. Not yeah. enough Park. Left. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Lauren, give us your fail. Give us your Rocky My Mountain fail roll. is that we are blanketed in smoke from multiple active spreading um, untamed wildfires from Fort Collins to Highlands Ranch and beyond, you know, um, Estes Park. And it's just... Uh, it's horrific and it's not a way to live, but it's our new reality. And I just have so much empathy for our, our neighbors and our communities right now because it's it's very, very stressful. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely the biggest fail of the week that that is happening and it sucks. Yeah, and just immunocompromised people, people with asthma, mm-hmm. like migraines. COPD, yeah. So, yeah, so much this just makes it so much worse. I saw that the acreage that it's reached now is like over 9,000. Yes. That was in the Denver Post it's, this morning. No. It's very, very stressful. And oh. like also people with depression, right? Like, Yeah. I mean, you can't go. It's like you can't go outside also if right. you can help it. And right. That's not. It's summertime. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I will give my Rocky Mountain Low yeah. of the Week. This was a just horrifying story from the Denver Post this week that we really should talk about. DPD recruit Victor oh, Moses. God. Um, is suing the police department over a, quote, barbaric hazing ritual in which he lost consciousness, repeatedly collapsed, and ultimately had to have both of his legs amputated. Mm. Um, The Denver Post reported on this. Moses has a medical condition that puts him at an increased risk. However, paramedics were aware of this condition and cleared him to participate. Um, the, The ritual I'm talking about apparently is known as fight day, um, Why does this exist? I mean, it's 2024, Denver Police Department. Yeah. What? That's the question here, I think, coming out of this is like, why Why are we doing such <sighs> such aggressive hazing? Is this really that important? Now, the Post quoted a criminology professor who says this is a very common type of training um, across the country and helps prepare recruits for scenarios they could face on patrol. Um, so like – I mean, I guess a police officer might experience violence on patrol, but I don't. Yeah, but we can do a, it in a way that doesn't harm someone and right. cause them to lose their limbs. Or if it's called a ritual, that does not seem like yeah, professional hey. training. Fight day. Right. I suspect that was the lawyer for Moses probably yeah. calling it that. 
Um, but yeah, this is like just just an awful story. We'll put a link to it in the show notes to to learn more and to I recommend reading for for Victor Moses's story, like his experience of like wanting to be a p- police officer in the first place, and then having to deal with this bullshit yeah, for and, the rest of his life. And they're already lacking in recruits, and it's like this kind of stuff is why people don't want to be police officers. I mean, it's like, there's just, I don't know another field of work that's so broken Mm -hmm. that continues to operate the way that it operates. It's wild to me. And I mean, I also, I feel bad that this man has been disabled by something that was totally preventable, Mm -hmm. like absolutely preventable. Fight Day encourages Denver police to engage in brutality and be indifferent to the injuries uh, they inflict. That's also not a mindset I'd love a cop to have out in the world. So, ooh. especially in light of Elijah McClain and and these other horrific abuses that we've experienced recently. Our, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about some good stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about our Rocky Mountain highs, the wins of the week. Um, I have a couple that I'm going to choose from, depending on how this goes. Um, <laughs> so I've got a contingency plan here. Okay. Lauren, do you want to give us your uh, well, Rocky Mountain Well, you high? know, my side Rocky Mountain high is that you're back from New York. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, this is not particularly timely. Anyone can do this at any time. Mm-hmm. But the I almost said, damn, the Denver Art Museum. But damn, the Denver Art Museum. <laughs> so incredible. I, I've been looking at, like, what are things to do inside, yeah. right? Because of the smoke, because of that. I went with my dad, his wife, my children, and everyone had a good time. And I used to think of art museums as stodgy, mm. right? And and I would always kind of, like, look for other things. Like, I love the first Friday Art Walk and, and Santa Fe and stuff mm-hmm. and sort of look for something that was, like, a little bit more edgy. But the Denver Art Museum has all these interactive spaces. It's not you're not just walking through the art museum. You can paint and you can collage and you can learn with your hands. And there's also just like big spaces for kids to be wacky. And you know, mm. um, it, it was just such a lovely experience. And kids are free, and so I will be going back. Right, I've been there like three times in the last couple of weeks, and oh, I will wow. be back again. What are the what's the temporary stuff up right now? Like, do they have good traveling exhibits? Gosh, I don't know. I literally have been spending time in, like, the area where you, all they have is paper, scissors, and glue. Oh, is that that first floor thing yes. on the stairs? Yeah, and that like, is cool. challenging yourself to think creatively without pens and markers is so awesome. Like, what can you make with paper, scissors, and glue sticks? And it's just a joy. They do such a good job of those interactive elements like Mm -hmm. that. The Desert Rider exhibit last year had the Uh, like the finger boarding skate park thing as part of it. And you could draw. They had low riders. Yeah, no, I think that's finger boarding. Uh huh. Like the little tech decks. Yeah, tech decks. Yeah, tech decks. And um, uh, they also have this cool exhibit. It's like interactive. It's on the second floor. It's called Space Command. My friend Chris Bagley built it. He has this crazy collection of like vintage astronaut gear oh wow and so it's on the second floor and you can kind of just like wander around and there's like a part that like plays i don't know it's like there's this there's like a astronaut suit hanging from the ceiling with a mannequin in it that's oh rotating right and yes stuff. Yeah, yeah yeah and it's just like it's really fun it's and fun it's whimsy it's a little bit weird yeah and we've got just so many great museums in denver and I, i'm just really enjoying trying them out such a good win. Couple of caveats. Dam is occasionally a sponsor on the show. That oh, had yes. nothing oh, to do with Lauren's fair. win. No, I did not know that. Uh, and then also connected to that, please accept our request for an interview about your repatriation efforts, Denver Art Museum. <laughs> it has been, been years. Why do you keep saying no? The people want to know. Um, <laughs> is it my turn? Should I go? Bree, do you want to go? It's up to you, Paul. You said you had some okay. a contingency plan, so you can go now. I'm going to share this song that uh, one of our listeners sent us what? this year. Uh, this week, um, f- uh, one of our librarian listeners. Oh, I um, love our librarian. So I think this is going around on social media a few weeks ago, but I saw it now. S- uh, someone visited our city and stumbled across something and felt inspired. That's okay. what happened. So Can't I'm going to I you. love this stuff. Out to Colorado to see the pirates play at course and saw a statue of a man who never played before. It looked like a creative player from MVP 2005. You might say it was a confusing eyesore. The guy who made this thing was Colorado High. He was cracking himself up when he removed his eyes. 
Black was really wordy, more boring than a lullaby. Create a player guy, Colorado. I don't know what this statue is. I love multiple intersection, like subcultures (laughs) coming together in one song on Instagram. The John Denver stuff, the Rocky stuff. Weed. Yeah. Yeah. Weed. The, 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 do you all know the, like the create a player reference? The MLB to the, in video games, when you do like a, when you play a sports game, sometimes you'll make a version. They can say you can make a player and, and, and you can be the player and go through a career. And like it starts with a very generic face. That you then modify oh, if you yeah. want to make it look like you. But, you know, this statue is apparently remedy. Yeah, Do I you agree. know who the statue is of? It's just nothing. Just it just nothing. says the player. It does. Okay. Because oh. the Rockies have never had a player yeah. so great to you be worth what? a statue. That is so, I mean, to use a different sports reference, par for the course for the Rockies because – we're not good. We don't even have anybody that we yeah. want to memorialize. Yeah. One of my biggest regrets was when I first moved here in my early 30s um, and I was very single and having a lot of fun. I mm-hmm. went to a Rockies game with baseball friends and they were like, Lauren, you got to date a Rockies player. And I was you like, could have. I'm already too old. And they were like, you, you speak Spanish. They're so cute. Do, go for it. <laughs> and I I didn't jump on that. And I should have. And now looking back, I, it might be one of my biggest regrets is not like what proving them. Been? Yeah. Showing what them that I could been? do it. So good. Um, Rockies players, if you're listening, I'm sure some of our listeners might. Maybe you know, I know Denverite's doing their classifieds friend yeah, finder. Like, we want to do meet a, meet a Rockies. <laughs> First, for blind dates. Or something. <laughs> oh my god! You know, I being a club goer, goer in the early two thousands in Lodo, mm-hmm. I could have taken you to some places. I definitely knew where the Nuggets hung out. Oh, but wow. they hung out at Lodo. This really awful bar called Lotus. Actually, it might have been a Francois joint. Oh, Francois Safiudin. Yes, mm-hmm. it was in uh, it was in Union Station before Union Station got revamped when it was just all busted. And we definitely knew that Nuggets players hung wow. out there, so we would go there sometimes. Cool, cool. Um, uh, Bree, yeah, your Rocky Mountain High of the week. Um, mine is also not necessarily timely. It's any time, but uh, over the weekend, I was at the Underground Music Showcase last weekend, and I had been I had not been into HQ since it became HQ. It oh, used to on be on South Broadway. Mm-hmm, yeah, okay. It used to be Three Kings, the Cherry Pit, Sixty South, the Zoo, all these things before that. But mm-hmm. I hadn't been into this iteration, and it just um, I knew they had been through a flood and stuff. It looked great. It was great. It was like. Really nice. And also, I will say, in the 20 years I've been going to that space in the, all those iterations, this is the nicest the bathrooms have ever looked. <laughs> so congratulations, HQ. Love a clean bathroom. Clean bathrooms. It was accessible. It was really nice. Their stage is accessible. Their backstage is accessible, I will also just say, which is not common. Mm. I, mean, I was there to see, obviously, my husband and his bandmate, Wheelchair Sports Camp. So this is something I'm thinking about. But it was just really nice. Hmm. So HQ, your spot looks great. If you haven't been to a show there, go to a show there. If you haven't played a show there, I bet it's fun to play a show there. Great stage. That's so. awesome. Do you know? Do you know HQ, Lauren? Have you been by? No, there? I don't. But I mean, I love Underground Music Fest. Like that That's... is one of the best things in Denver, and I'm so glad it's still here because a lot of like it was crazy. The, le- busy. the lefty indie stuff is is. Yeah. not able to survive as like the cost of living goes up. So I'm just so glad that's still here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's locally owned and operated and it was great. So. You know, Brie, uh, maybe this is a subsidiary win, but you were telling me about your friend uh, in Kiltro, that band oh, Kiltro. Yeah, my, Fernando, my old drummer in Kiltro. Yeah. I've been listening to their stuff all week. I love They're it. They're great. So sh- shout out to Kiltro. Great music. Yeah, Peruvian they actually, folk. Oh. And they had Wes cool. Watkins come up and play some trumpet for them this, this last weekend too. It was so fun. Yeah. They're a great band. Maybe we'll go out on a song by Kiltro here yeah. into the into the end credits. Shout out to my friend Fernando. Great, Fez, great music. Joaquin, great, great wins all around. Guzman Garcia Jr. Is that really his, his whole name? I think I may be just put extra ones in there, oh. but those are all parts of his name. <laughs> I don't think he goes by all of them. <laughs> and his mom. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> all right, I think we're done with the show. Um, Lauren, uh, it's been so great having yeah, you back. Thanks. You're gonna have to come back again. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, when there's not some natural disasters happening. <laughs> yes. Something more fun. <laughs> um, but uh, but Bree, yeah, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, guys. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. Our producers this week were Olivia Jewel Love and me, Paul Caroli. 
Peyton Garcia writes our morning newsletter, Hey Denver. Bree Davies is our host. Our music is by Los Mocochetes, with additional mixing by Tyler Lindgren. If you haven't already, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And tell Denver Art Museum director Christoph Heinrich about us the next time you see him. You can sign up for that daily newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. See you next week. Like, actually, unfortunately, this happened to my son's school last week. Really? Yeah. Someone had, someone brought their sick kid to school two days in a row, and the teacher was like, you can't bring a sick kid to school. And a badly Yelp review. And oh. so they or went on Google, Google reviews and tried to, like, t- and I felt so bad because it's, like, a small, sweet school. And so they sent out an email. They're like, hey, can anybody leave us a review? We need help. And so I wrote this, like, beautiful, eloquent oh, yeah. piece to my son's <laughs> school. I was like, I love the teachers, the caregivers, the every, they're beautiful. Like, this teacher wrote me and was like, thank you for doing that. We were, like, having so much trouble.